And welcome everyone to this week's IPLD SYNC meeting. It's February the 1st, 2021. And as every week we go over the stuff that we've done in the last week, and then we talk about what we plan to do next. Um, I start with myself. Um, I haven't done that much last week. I guess also some Falcon work. But I think the most interesting thing for this group is that I wrote a small blog post about WebAssembly might return values in today's Rust without WAS and BindGen. Um, the background is that in WASM you can have more than just one return value um, in the new versions. And I thought it would be straightforward to do this in Rust, um, but it isn't <laughs> there for the blog post. Um, and the reason why you would want to have multiple returns is um, as WebAssembly is so restricted to, to the return types, if you, for example, want to return um, a string, you return it where you have put it in the memory and what you need to return is the, the actual position in the memory as well as the length. So it's two values. And so it's way more convenient than just returning one value, which you can then read out, which has the size and the position. Um, so that's quite useful. Um, and next week is um, for all people who work at Protocol Labs. Um, it's a thing called Hack Week, where we spend time on projects using our own stack outside of the scope that we normally work on. And I will work with Will on getting Jitsi work through lib P2P. And the idea is that um, you don't need a Jitsi server, but just can somehow talk to someone else remote uh, in a distributed way. Um, that's the idea. We'll see. Um, probably next week, we, I have an update on this, even if it's not IPD related. Um, OK, and next on my list is Danielle. Cool. So this past week, I was mostly finishing, um, well, I mostly got my hammed ADL to agree with Filecoins hammed on just what the Seaboard bytes look for a very simple map. Um, I was mostly there last week. I just got stuck on the parameters for a long time. Um, essentially, the default parameters for the bit for the bit width and the hash algorithm that the library provides you look nothing like what Falcon uses um, apparently. And I was looking at Rod's spec for the real Falcon data, uh, but I was incorrectly using the defaults. So once I fixed that, it actually looks the same, which is nice. Um, and Essentially, what I need to finish to make this usable to like read Filecon data, assuming I made no other mistakes, is a reification. So like taking some um, block layer nodes and then interpreting them as my ADL. And then supposedly that should magically work to read key values from a, an existing map. Um, but that's pretty much it. I'm going to I need to tidy up the code and push it. It's quite a lot of if else code for Falcon support. And this next week, like Volker mentioned, we've got the Hack Week. And my project, so far at least, is essentially a re-implementation of IPFS desktop, but with an Electron. And all IPFS desktop does really is use Electron to show a fancy web UI, but that's separate. You can just open it with a browser. And the things I'm going to um, implement are the status tray icon and sort of the system integrations, which are easy enough to do with Go. Uh, and the cool thing with that is that eventually it could become part of Go IPFS itself. It's it's still not like pure Go by nice standards because it's a lot of C Go. So for example, to build Windows, you need a Windows machine because because of, of all the system headers. But it should still be okay, I think. We'll see. That's it for me. Thanks. Next on the list is Michael. Hey, uh, sorry, I'm trying to get my headphones working real quick so that you can hear me a little bit. Let's see if that works. Okay. All right, cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to write my updates, but um, I can just talk about them for a second. Um, the, the first one, and this is like so annoying, um, IPJS, which we use for all of the JavaScript builds, um, the way that it works is that it like produces a package JSON and then dumps it out. Um, and 
that ended up surfacing this really annoying bug in rollup and then also just like an annoying part about how Node.js specified the resolution algorithm. Um, it turns out that the ordering like really matters for the keys because the spec kind of assumes that package JSON is a configuration language and not like the output of a build tool. Um, so they really, really care about the ordering. So if you have a browser field and you want it to actually be used, it literally has to be first. Um, there's no way around it. And so I fixed that. And so that'll work now when people do it, but there's another really bad bug in Rollup, um, which basically, Rollup has like these, the, it has logic that is separate for resolving the main field versus the subtree imports. So even though they're effectively doing the same thing. Um, and what that means is that it wasn't actually including browser in the default import for sub imports. Um, even when you had said browser true in Rollup. So you were literally telling Rollup hey, get browser things. And then you have a thing that says, hey, I'm the browser thing for this sub import. And it was like not picking it up, um, even when it was first. So um, you can work around it by adding this thing to config, but it is a bug. So that's like logged in roll up now. And I think that'll have the link in there. Um, and we're like on, like in line to, to have it be fixed here. But what that means is that right now, like multi-formats, um, ES, yeah, multi-formats imports of ESM in roll up of all of the sub package parts are broken. So you can import the main package and import all the properties out of it, but you can't do like multi-format slash block right now. Um, so that's dumb. Uh, other than that, um, I wrote, uh, I, I've been working on IP SQL, figuring out how to kind of how to explain it, how to tease things apart. Um, and now I have like a, a sort of fairly well-designed system for what I'm calling SQL proofs and um, I can actually give a little talk about it with some slides, like at the end of this, if we have time. Um, but, but essentially like, unlike a proof of work, it's not providing you something that you can verify with a fraction of the computation. The computation is the same to verify the proof, um, but it, it reduces all of the data that you would need. So what happens is that like you do any operation in SQL and what you get back are sets for the blocks that are read and written by that, um, as well as the new state of the database. And this ends up being like an amazing primitive for building all of the traditional database workflows that you would want. So replications between any states can actually be done by diffing these sets now. So we don't have to do crazy graph traversals. We don't have to like figure out all that logic. You literally like do whatever crazy thing that you want to do in SQL. We run that SQL engine over a full traversal for somebody that actually has all of the data. And then what they produce is something that, oh yeah, you can do this now with a fraction of the data. Um, and you can treat these things like CRDTs because they're one way functional transforms now. Um, you can do encrypted versions of the sets that don't let the recipient actually see any of the data, just the result. And you can even exchange that back with the original key holder and they can use that to calculate all of the same deltas as they would with the unencrypted version of this, even though the, the person that you shared it with like couldn't actually see any of that data. Um, there's like really cool stuff that you can do with this now. Um, that I'm working out in these slides that, that I can show in a bit. But um, yeah, that's kind of the, the gist of my update. And what will you work on next week? Same thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, th I mean, this week for the, for the hack week, I want to get um, like an in-browser playground working for IP SQL. So you should be able to like create databases and, and do SQL queries and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and, and hopefully that can actually be turned into like a tutorial where I talk about how this stuff works with like in browser embeds, if I get to that. Cool. Um, next one is Peter. Yes, uh, so on IPLT front, uh, still stuck a little bit in, in the uh, big old school data uh, place, uh, but you know, almost almost there. Um, other than that, I spent a number of uh, hours uh, last week and uh, today as well with the Dean kind of mapping out, well, helping him map, map out uh, the ability to get large blocks through BitSwap, which uh, from our perspective, you can basically think of it as 
uh, how to move around uh, large streams without opening yourself to a DDoS. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is something that we'll uh, try to put together uh, throughout Hack Week, uh, a minimum, minimum proof of concept because there are like a lot of uh, corner cases that you have to uh, be kind of like aware of, not uh, not to be completely DDoSed. But uh, the basic idea is uh, basically an augmentation of something that uh, Steven uh, sketched out like way back, something like 2017 or something like that. Uh, where we basically say that uh, there is some way for you as a client to query uh, other uh, peers for what we call an SID, which is essentially just a different uh, streaming hash function, be it you know, SHA-1, SHA-256, 75, doesn't matter, anything that can basically restart itself with minimal state. And you get back a, a set of blocks that you, a manifest that describes a set of blocks that if you pull out, you should be able to assemble this into a stream that you can then verify with this additional information in the manifest, which basically tells you at every uh, megabyte or so, what with, with a particular initialization vector of the hash, that you are using for this SID, if you run it against the data that you already got, uh, you should end up with the very same SID as the cache of the entire thing. And yeah, uh, we basically map, map, map the higher level uh, portion of that. And uh, I didn't know uh, checking in with, uh, with other folks, which one of our options they like best. And uh, yeah, we'll see how this goes during Happy. And so I have. Thanks. Next one is Will. Sure. Um, relevant thing to IPLD last week, I took uh, state diff and the GraphQL stuff and pulled that up to actors v3. Um, so it now has a realized Filecoin schema with the new schema. It turns out that was a lot of code duplication, but no actual changes. Um, which is exciting. Um, and that's because I don't actually schema the uh, hamps themselves. I just pretend like they are their ADLs. So I pretend like it is a map and both before and after they are maps. Um, so none of the types in my representation of the schema change. However, I have to duplicate all of the types so that I know that I am in a V3 node. And therefore when I see a hamp in that V3 node, I should use the newer hamped loader to load those hamps. So I have essentially now multiple versions that are tagged just on their struct names um, for the older and newer style nodes throughout Filecoin. So and so that my loader can based on which one it's which subtree it's in, if it's in a v3 versus a v2 um, state root, know which hamp loader it should be using when it runs into one of these hamped types. Um, but that seems to largely be working. Um, the pressure uh, has uh, reduced somewhat uh, as the V3 actor upgrade is still pending. Um, the two things I will call out uh, on that. One, um, the Filecoin people did not change all of their hamps to V3 hamps. There are still some V2 hamps lurking in Filecoin. So we will still not have a full data model uh, even after this upgrade. Um, uh, in particular, messages uh, as linked from uh, each block header are still linked using the previous hand. Uh, and there is no versioning pointer uh, on the block header or the messages struct in which to signal that it should now use a different hand implementation, uh, unlike the state roots. So they are thinking about how to do that and hope that at some point in the future, they will and likely expect to do it just on a block height. So once you end up with a block header whose height is above some number, you now know that the messages will be encoded in a different way. So there will be a new implicit thing to learn. The other implicit thing is bit widths, which previously we just sort of had as this constant five that we knew of in terms of how you size and think about hamps uh, are now parameterized and are different in different hamps. Um, and this is another sort of piece of data that somewhere lives in the schema because there are some times where you run into these hamps and you're like, oh, this is a hamp with bit with six. And versus these ones are hamps with bit with five. Um, I don't 
know if we have a great place to encode that um, anywhere um, besides a comment. But it is important, certainly, when we go to mutate. Um, I think less so when you go to read, although it is useful to know. I, I think you can in, infer it from uh, how wide the bit width is of that bit field, potentially. Um, but uh, there is this additional implicit parameter that's been added that, you know, they, they just keep making rods life easy. Um, I think that's all I have to say about uh, amps and uh, that data structure. Uh, and indeed, for this week, um, starting to work on uh, the JavaScript uh, side of things, I have JSIPFS building and in a browser, and it seems to get a node ID and connect to things. Um, using the new web pack, which, uh, oh boy, um, it now no longer does all the polyfills for you in V5, so you have to notice all of the various things that don't exist and slowly fix them until things load, but it doesn't eventually load, so that's good. Uh, and so now, um, I think the, the first step is, can I get, um, using like the DHT providers to find all the nodes that are also interested in the same SID, and then from there, make a pub sub group around that collection of nodes to be able to send messages to other people in a room and do some sort of message back and transport in the browser. So that's the plan for this week. Cool. Thanks. Next is Rod. Uh, it's one of those weeks where I've had to go back and try and catalog what I've done because it doesn't feel like I've achieved a big chunk of anything. Um, and But that but that is because I was looking after the kids mostly last week, so I actually didn't get much done. Um, so Dag Jason was on the cards. I've been really digging in heavily to that because I'm, I can taste completion of that. I really feel like I've tied up Dag PB and Dag Seabor. I I really want Dag Jason done because I, I I just I keep on wanting to use it for test fixtures, um, just to be able to express anything you want to do with block mutations and creations in a, a readable test, uh, in a test that you can copy and paste. So that's, that really is my main motivation with DAG, DAG JSON, but getting it just consistent and sorted out would be really nice completion. So um, trying really hard to get that. I've, I've got a new, uh, I, don't think, I don't think I was at the meeting last week. So some of this is from the week before, but I have a new uh, JavaScript implementation that um, uses a lot of the same backend code as the DAG Seaboard work that I did um, to do parsing and encoding. Uh, in the sort of the deterministic way with all the rules that we care about. Um, and I, and the, the reason I did that was not, I, I was skeptical that I could actually replace the, the, the current one because of speed, but it turns out I can, like the speed is, is um, comparable and even better in some places. So um, that's great. But um, the, the thing I wanted to get to was this problem that Eric's having with um, the tokens in um, the, CID and bytes, how you, how, as, as you're, as you're essentially stream reading it, um, you, you want to be able to bail early and either say, this is not what I think it is. And it's just some standard map or it's a malformed bytes or CID, or it is a CID or a bytes. Um, and so that processing step, we, we don't we classically haven't had to deal with in JavaScript because you just instantiate the whole thing and then you inspect it. Um, but if you do it in a streaming fashion, then it, it becomes a different beast. And so I wanted to get to that so I could play around with it to um, describe those rules. So um, in the pull request that I've linked for the specs repo for DAG JSON, I've got, I've, I've described those rules. Uh, I know there's been some comments on that for um, fixing up the language, um, which I, I'm appreciative of because it's, it's hard to describe them clearly. Um, so I'll try and, um, focus on getting that done. Um, the, the other thing was I, I, I did I have been meaning to ask Eric where the uh, IPLE prime version is at because he started a pull request to properly add the bytes and I think CID stuff into IPLD prime. And that, that was then just sitting on a branch that he has sort of abandoned, but the branch now seems to be gone. So I'm wondering if that work's just been completely thrown away and we need to sort of start again um or something else so it'd be nice to get IPLD prime up to scratch with this as well that's really the end goal is to have the two implementations work exactly the same um the other thing i've been playing a lot with is the encryption stuff that michael started um 
the pull request in the specs repo and the one in multi formats um trying to work out it because we really are even though like yeah let's use aes we're, we're still inventing a new crypto system <laughs> and and that has all of the you know the caveats about you shouldn't invent your own crypto system um that come along with it uh so just been trying to um figure out all of the boundaries of this thing so that when we roll it out we can say things like this is good for these situations and it has sensible defaults and it won't let you do a foot gun for most cases but please don't use it in these places because it, it you won't get the guarantees that you expect um and that's yeah there's, there's a lot of space for that um if people just pick this off the shelf saying here's a generic encryption thing that i could use for my application which does it has a particular model of moving data around um there's potential for things to go bad so yeah anyway I, I, some thoughts have been sort of dropping into that specs pr um and yeah we'll see we'll move forward on that soon yeah, I need to reply to that a bit meaning too. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, we should we should put in there which of these algorithms that we recommend, like which of these is the best, because it's it's silly to not do that and just have a list of algorithms. Um, yeah, and then whatever other algorithms we want to add, like I I don't care what they are, like they're just they're just cipher entries in the multi-formats table, right? Like we're not ensuring that there's an implementation around. So um, I think I think that's me. Yeah, thanks. And uh, next is Carson. Hi, I'm the uh, I'm the outsider here, and I'm actually in a public space, so I got to keep the mask on. Um, uh, I'm in a hotel lobby, so I'll keep it super short. I've uh, listed a few things that I'm uh, doing this week, including tinkering with some of the IPSQL SQL proofs as CRDTs stuff that. Um, Hopefully, a couple of slides we'll, we can go through later. Um, and that's related to some work that I've been doing around um, uh, Merkle DAGs as CRDTs, um, a general purpose CRDT. Um, so that's quite exciting uh, for me to see. To just today, I was reading some of Michael's stuff, and it was like, oh, damn, we can solve a lot of problems with this like CID set primitive. So that's really cool. Um, uh, I've also started, um, doing some sort of like documentation on the textile front and in doing so started releasing a bunch of JavaScript libraries for like very simple primitives for testing peer to peer like systems. So I just released a library called libp2p bundle, which basically is just the, the libp2p bundle that is used as the default in IPFS. So that if you want just a, just the lib p2p bundle that exactly ipfs uses but you just want the lib p2p bundle you can just use that and all the defaults are the same and it turns out to be super duper handy because i can just drop that in um without having to get a whole like lib p2p repo set up and everything and it's zero config and it just kind of works so that's nice and i'll put a little more effort into packaging that up a bit nicer for like um a full ES build so that you could just kind of pull the ES module in a browser and a few things like that. But for now, it's pretty handy. And I've it's helped me test a bunch of like peer to peer, just like block exchange um, algorithms really easily. And so, in coupled with that, I released something called libp2p RPC, which lets you, and that uses um, uh, uh, Michael's really simple RPC library um, so that you can just like test test different RPC configurations and you just use this libp2p bundle and it's really easy. You can test all sorts of really cool like graph sync algorithms and things really quickly. So that's been quite fun. And I got a little sidetracked with that because I've been playing around with, you know, different block exchange algorithms. Um, and so it turns out you can take those same sort of tools and do like fetch the fetch API over libp2p um, and also all sorts of other neat things and then you realize that if you can get two peers two browser peers connected over like WebRTC, you can do like http queries between the two of them and some fun things like that so that you get a peer acting like a server and a the server acting like a peer which is fun um 
And then on the textile front, we just had a big team meeting where we're trying to unify how we do like tokens and access across our stack. And we're starting to lean towards something that the, fit, the Fission team has been working on called UCANs, user access tokens. Basically it's a way to encode a JWT with like nested permissioning. And if you take that and you couple it with some of the DAG Jose work that um, uh, that OED and I uh, helped to uh, fund, then you can get like basically IPLD structures that nest permissions. And so you can pass like with a, you know, with like as a header, you can say, look, here's my, my UCAN and wh whoever's operating that UCAN can trace the history of like permission allocation all the way back to the root. And those that's with an IPLD link. So you can do things like say, look, I own this data, but I'm telling this, I'm telling this peer that they can also do some sort of operation. And I sign that. And then I link my initial signature in the UCAN. And then that peer can pass that UCAN along and say, look, so and so said I could do this. Um, and you can trace it all the way back to the root permission. And um, so you can start to. And the rule is like those permissions have to be less than or equal to the permissions of the like root. So you can have like increasingly fine grained permission allocation in a sort of trustless or well, you could trust that the, the root is, is allowed to give those permissions. And then it, you can start to do some really great like capability based access control with that. So that's something we're exploring and it's looking pretty promising. Um, yeah, that's super cool. Sounds like uh, object capabilities. Um, it's what it's based on. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and uh, huge props to the U or to the Fission team for like marrying JWTs and some of Google's. Um, uh, oh shoot, what's that French dessert called? M uh, macaroons. Google's macaroons sort of uh, set up and JWTs and IPLD kind of all placed together this way. It's quite it's quite a simple but powerful like access control primitive. So. If you've got a link to some of these things, uh, that would be really great in the docs in so that sure. we can uh, look them up. Cause that sounds really interesting that what you just mentioned. Cool. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll provide some links. Thanks Carson. Um, Eric, do you have an update? Uh, not a ton this week, didn't come super prepared, sorry. <laughs> Uh, maybe off the top of my cuff, um, I did a little bit of code review with Daniel and a couple of other people this week and realized that like, maybe I actually need to back down on one of the approaches that I was taking to the schema DMT unification stuff before the, like, it, it actually got out of hand. Um, so we're thinking about actually cycle breaking with that in a different way. The problem originated from having our generated code had methods on it which could uh, expose their own type information self-describingly and that meant it ended up with a cycle uh, and so we're actually thinking we might just stop doing that because so far that feature has actually been kind of hypothetical in its utility so like maybe just we won't uh, and that'll let us break some of the cycles that were previously problematic and maybe let us get through this with just a lot less kerfuffle so that's probably in the future. All right, thanks. Um, Johnny, do you have an update? Yeah, just uh, the stuff I'm working on with uh, the did specification and just the drama behind it. So uh, Michael and Rod, I appreciate your comments and helping me out and Juan chimed, chimed in too. And I think, uh, you're just trying to figure out and navigate uh, politically the path forward. It's not about the technology it, or just the, the lack of the IPLD with the DAG Seabor spec not being like normative referenced, then actually it's getting booted out of the, the did specification or the fact that I borrowed some of the, the canonical algorithm text from the spec, but I put it in the Seabor section, hoping that the, the DAG Seabor section will inherit it. And so then it opens up a whole Pandora's box as far as contribution and IPR and uh, and then mime types and just that's just uh, oh the drama. <laughs> so 
So I, I, I'm not sure what the path forward is. There are actually some uh, talk about maybe creating it in the did spec registries, um, but it's that would be places to put properties, not um, core representations. So there, there's uh, if we bump it out of the, the spec, which is going to Canada to release the next like a week or two, then um, it's just going to get dropped, and which is frustrating because I've been like involved for like two years now, and to to get I wanted to see did documents as uh, Dag Seabor and uh, and mostly the uh, uh, anyways frustrating. Thanks. Um, well, so well done on your patience anyway, because even just a, <laughs> a couple of weeks in that thread has been stretching mine. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so this was the update. Um, is there anything else on the agenda? Else we get Michael to present some of his stuff. Yeah, Michael, do you want to? I don't see any. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Start the broadcast. Do, 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 do. I'm sharing my screen now. Here we go. Here we go. Um, probably won't even get to that. Okay. We'll just do what we can get through, um, which is good because towards the end, I, I run out of steam a little bit. Um, okay. So SQL proofs. Okay. So the, the sort of if you separate a database into three different parts, it becomes much clearer how you do kind of decentralized database and decentralized SQL in particular um, in this model. So we're really separating kind of state transitions um, from like over a, a consistent state representation. So you need these transitions and then you need to refer to the states of those transitions. Um, and you need to do that over a mutex, right? So a database usually offers you like some kind of head that people have agreed to that you're doing that on. Um, and so you have, you have sort of state on a mutex um, and then storage is, is separate from that. And I think that we're all really used to separating up that storage layer and that, that being sort of any key value store that you can put the blocks in. But um, I think for you know, other people that, that's gonna be pretty new. Um, usually a database writes to a very specific file format that you continue to run. Um, so if we look at like a traditional database architecture, we just have like one state, we need to move it to the second state and we're taking a bunch of operations and doing kind of intermediate transactions that we can roll back um, as we do that. And then we, we eventually kind of commit it to this mutex. Um, and a typical database that's done with like an fsync call where you actually like write all of that to disk um, and sort of batch up the entire transaction. And, and you know, if it's, if you want to guarantee that it's in multiple locations, then that's actually an F-sync in multiple computers in different places. And then what this all means is that when you get back a response for a write, you have a guarantee that that is actually written to disk, that that is actually the state that everybody agrees on now, right? Okay, so F-sync really doesn't work for distributed systems, right? Like we can't, we can't put all of our guarantees on top of this. Um, and if we want decentralized systems, like we're probably gonna do that with cryptography, right? Like we wanna, we wanna replicate um, some of these uh, guarantees that we're getting in a decentralized system. Um, and so many databases like in the NoSQL world and are, are eventually consistent and highly scalable because it turns out that if you wanna do SQL, you, it's really hard to make it entirely consistent and distributed because you can't really model it without like one of these FSIN guarantees. Um, so what most uh, big scale databases end up being is like a lower level primitive than SQL. It doesn't do as much as SQL. It does like a fraction of what SQL does often. Um, but like, you can model all this behavior on top of it and then you're working with a primitive that can do everything. But uh, what we wanna do here is actually take all of SQL um, and actually give you SQL as a language to, to do the manipulation um, and allow that to work in a distributed system. So, okay, so that's what we're gonna use SQL proofs for. So a, a SQL proof is just a functional transformation. It literally takes an input hash and it produces an output hash. Um, and for that implementation and version of, of IP SQL, it will always produce that hash, right? Like that's, that's completely deterministic. Once this stabilizes and turns into a spec, then it'll be like really consistent, right? Um, but we're, we're essentially talking about this deterministic state transfer from one state to another. Um, and the, the input is the current hash of the database and a SQL statement. 
if you take those things together and hash it, that's that's the input hash, right? Um, the output uh, is a little bit more complicated. It's not just the sort of database after that. Like we're talking about reads and writes here. We're not just talking about writes. Um, what you get back is a result. So when you're doing a, a SQL query, uh, you'll get back like a bunch of column data, right? Um, if you're doing a write, you won't get a result. And then you get two sets, essentially. One is the blocks for the reads and one is the blocks for the writes. Um, and if you're just doing a read, you obviously, you won't have any writes. Um, and these CID sets are, are trees, just like the sort of chunky trees that I've been talking about forever that we built the database on. Um, but we can like continue to, to improve and refine these even further, but they already are like really capable data structures for doing comparisons. Um, and then finally you get the hash at the end of executing the statement. So if it was a query, then it'll be the same hash as the input hash. Um, but if it's, if it's changed the database, then now you have the new head of the database at the end of the statement. Okay, very important to lock in right here that we are not talking about traversals and we are not describing traversals as part of these data structures. Um, there are obviously traversals happening when you execute a SQL statement, you're going to traverse the tree, but we, what will you get back in this proof is not anything that tells you about traversing. Um, and we never ship around anything about traversing between peers. What we ship around are these proofs that have sets of all of the block addresses that were accessed. Um, and you don't have to traverse beyond that to understand the working set of the data. And this is really important because we, we can compare these all of the time to produce deltas, right? It's not just that a write will produce a CID set that is a delta on the previous state. It's also that a read gives me back a set of all the data that it took to read it. And if I run that query again on a new database state, I can take the new set and compare it against the old set and get back the delta. Um, so if we're talking about, you know, like what, what we sort of do with GraphSync today, we, we actually never do more than one request and response anymore, right? If I need you to do a SQL query, I'm gonna say, hey, run this query. And instead of sending me back like the entire proof or all of the, the reads in that set, give me back the delta between that and this prior state that, that I had before. And you can just get back that delta. So you, you can turn like every synchronization operation and every application operation into a, like a, a, requ a quick request response cycle. Um, so yeah. So the, the proofs are, are both the state chains, they're both these transactional state changes, and they're also the read interface. Um, so that's like important to keep in mind. Um, and I, I haven't even gotten into to how mutexes work, but you can you can imagine a chain of these, right? That is like updating a database in the store somewhere. You could, you know, publish that new state in, in IPNS, you can stick it, you know, somewhere else that's permanent in an authority, like however you want to say this is the current state of the database, like you you can say that about <clears throat> what you get at the end of this proof, right? Um, I talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but it, it's really important to note that like these proofs do not reduce the amount of computation that somebody would need to do to verify them. They only reduce the, the set of data, um, but they do that incredibly well. So, you know, you can have a data provider or that can literally be untrusted and they have access to all of the data, which could be petabytes, right? Um, and what you get back is, you know, just the, the small fraction of that data that is necessary to um, verify the proof that you just got for your query or for your mutation. Um, okay, any questions until, before we move on, actually, I should probably like pause for a second. Um, I have one. So if you, mm -hmm. so the sets return, do they only return the, the leaf of your query or every CID no. you've encountered? Every CID, every CID. It's literally um, yeah. like, it, it's literally a set that gets passed, like in JavaScript, it is literally a set that gets passed through the entire read interface. So every time that it reads a, a block of data um, or pulls um, a node out of cache that has a block address associated with it, that gets added to a set. And, um, and yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's literally like the entire tree all the way up. So you would never need to, to do a traversal. That's why it's the, and, and it's also the entire Merkle proof though, right? So it's not just the leaves of that tree. It's yeah. all the branches that it took to get there. Yeah, because you can then trace that back from the root and verify the proof. Yeah. So, so these sets can actually be passed around by their root because they're yeah. like, a, yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, the, and the great thing about them, right? Is that like, if you encrypt the data, 
um, then you can um, you don't have to encrypt the tree on top of those addresses, right? Like you can have a bunch of encrypted addresses that are in a set and the set itself is actually like readable. And so you can pass that around like in the clear and use it for your replication state. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and you can, re and you can refer to that set just by, by its hash, obviously. Um, yeah, and I mean, and these are like designed for efficient deltas between each other, right? Like that's, that's where we get set data structures from. Um, and these are no different. So. Um, yeah, I think that we've actually covered everything in this this slide already. Um, cool. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's like see it right real quick. Um, so yeah. So we take this uh, DB is null because we're creating a new database. We we say create table with the schema, um, and what we get back is a set of all the rights that were necessary for that and the new DB. Right. So if we're you know implementing this database, we just write all those to storage. We update whenever mutex. You do an insert, uh, so we're gonna insert some values into here now. What we get back is like the new writes, the new state. We do the same thing again. Now we're updating our database, pretty cool. Um, something that, that is really interesting about this, uh, and, and I'll talk about this a little bit because I haven't had time to create slides around it yet. Um, the schema for a table acts like a contract. It, it ensures that whoever runs these proofs in the future when they do new inserts is going to do the work of generating the indexing structures that you need in order to do the where queries against those columns. So that's a really kind of cool feature, right? Like we, we as you kind of design your tables and design what you're doing, you're, you're also sort of baking these operate, like these uh, requirements into the operations that get run on them. Um, another really interesting thing happens with DAG tables, right? So haven't documented this yet, but I have a DAG table implementation where um, it's rows just like a, a reg, just like a typical SQL database. But what you insert are CIDs to whole graphs. Um, and then the column names that you add for the schema are paths into that structure. And so what happens in, in, in this, uh, when it is implemented as like this contract, right, is that you're effectively plucking off the data in the graph that you need for these indexing structures. And you're not actually storing the rest. So if you know all of the indexing that you need on a huge chain um, and you don't wanna store the entire graph because it's huge, like it's the file coin chain, for instance, um, you, you can bake into the contract, oh, traverse these properties to create these indexes. And then every time that somebody does a write of a new state, we know that those traversals will happen um, in order to get those indexes and those reads will show up in the read set but the read set won't include the rest of the graph that we didn't say that we needed to index, right? So this is like an efficient sort of plucking structure as you, as you go over time as well. Um, let's look at reads real quick. So yeah, uh, we do a C, we select, we get back a result. Um, that result also has um, a hash on it. So if I do proofs in the future, I can check um, if the result has changed by just looking at the hash, which is really nice, um, provided that I, that I trust the, the other party. Um, and then I get back uh, all the reads that were done and the database um, at the end of the transaction. Um, yeah, these both have hash addresses, right? Like we, we can, we hash the block for the input, the output is hashed as well. And now we actually know that this hash produces this hash. So this can just be cached forever, right? Um, I don't, oh, did I, I didn't write that in here, I don't think. Um, oh, damn, that's so cool though. Um, but if, if you imagine sort of structuring um, this operation as an HTTP request, so you're putting in the HTTP request like uh, the different states that you're changing, that HTTP request can be cached forever, right? In, in whatever caching layer, because it's just this hash to that hash. The same thing happens when you're doing Delta calculations. If you say, do this query on this hash, but then only return me a car file of the Delta between this prior read set, then it's gonna return you a car file in that HTTP request. And that whole thing can also be cached like forever in HTTP cache. Um, yeah, we talked about that. Um, yeah, so now, we, uh, we insert new data into the database. We run the query again with the new database state. And oh, yep, we got this new read, this, this new set of uh, reads for the CIDs. Um, we can then, oh yeah, yeah, I do have that in here, sorry. But yeah, um, yeah, so if we, as we yeah, I just talked about this, I don't need to talk about it again. But yeah, if you have like literally like give me the read delta, then the response can be cached uh, forever. Um, and I'm really thinking that like car files actually are 
the exchange mechanism, I think, in whatever protocol that you build on this. Um, because uh, unlike sort of CADB and the stuff that I've been working working on that, that has an indexing structure over it, you always need all of these blocks and you always just load all of these blocks linearly when you get them. You actually don't seek into them because since you're already doing delta calculations everywhere, you always want all the blocks. So you're always going to actually just sort of like soak all of them up iteratively. So yeah, I think that car file is really like the right way to, to be moving this data around. Um, yeah, so like, why don't, actually, why don't I pause here again? So uh, questions at this point. Um, what does Rod think? <laughs> um, I, so <laughs> because I've been so recently playing with the Filecoin data, my mind immediately jumps to scale. Like this kind of stuff yeah, is, yeah. is is perfect for, this is perfect for large structures of data that you want to query and mutate because I mean, that's what SQL is good for, taking something really large and narrowing down into the thing that you want. And um, and these CID sets just make me think it's, there's a lot of CIDs. <laughs> there's a lot of data it's, it's being a... held and, and dealt with in memory. Well, the set, the sets aren't necessarily in memory; they can be in storage. Yeah, and I, and and I know like these are all practical concerns that can, can come later. Mm -hmm. um, I, mm -hmm. I, my concern is mainly simply that uh, I don't think that we uh, have. Um, uh, I I don't think we're we're actually very good at making sure that those practical concerns actually play out. Um, we don't have a good track record of that. And so I am becoming more concerned about that. Um, and we do a lot of theoretical work, but um, when the rubber hits the road, the things start yeah, to I mean, so, yeah. in, in, in some ways, I feel like a lot of these, um, the sort of garbage collection issues that we have right now um, in sort of trimming the set of data um, really comes from, from in, a belief that we were really going to be able to use traversals for a lot of this stuff that we could describe certain traversals that would give us just the data that we need or just sync the data that we need and stuff like that yeah. and i think that, that that's actually not panning out like a lot of like th these ideas are coming from a place where like actually like every time that i need something from you i need to be able to talk about deltas like we need to be able to move around just a part of this data um i need to be able to describe to you just the data that you need for something it's like actually like a like kind of more important than even the structure of the database in a way is that we have these sets that we can be comparing against. Yeah. 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 Cause I, cause I'm even, the, you know, the, the, the garbage collection thing now, the stuff I'm playing with this week, uh, I'm just messing around with, with browser video stuff, but I'm still having to, I, I coming against the data, the, uh, the garbage collection thing. Like I wanted, I want to do IPLD data structures, but I need to be able to efficiently discard the things that I don't use anymore when I do changes. And mm. it's just mm -hmm. so painful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just working with arbitrarily large and long graphs is, you know, difficult. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what was the other thing that I was going to say? Um, oh, yeah. There's another really interesting thing about the. I'll talk about this because it's it's like at the very end of these slides, and I haven't had time to really work it out yet, um, or haven't had time to document it yet, but. When I said like you can use these like CRDTs, what I mean is that because they're a one-way functional transform, right? You can always test if two changes compute. They're sorry, commute, um, because you can just apply them against each other, and if you have the same hash, like you're good. Um, and there's like a little bit of extra stuff that you want to do to like get pure append inserts out of the way, which you can do by examining the SQL AST. But for the most part, like you can actually you know take a thousand transactions on the same state that you sort of figured out what you wanted to do in parallel. And then you can, um, again, in parallel, test all of those in pairs of two and commute them, right? So you, you literally can run all of them concurrently um, in pairs of two and then pair that down in half and then pair that down in half from there. Um, and that, that can be a very expensive operation to do, but one of the really nice things about having a set for the reads and a set for the writes for every one of the transactions that you're commuting is that when you launch another process or you hand this off to a, 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 whatever concurrency vector that you're using, you know like all of the blocks that you need to access in order to do it. 
with, with like a 99.9% probability. Like most of these commutation operations are gonna happen in these threads without needing any other reads other than what you hand to them um, because you just took the, the sets and put them together. Um, there, there, there are edge cases in which you um, end up causing merges in the tree when you change it. And so like every 10,000 changes to like an integer index, for instance, will end up probably changing one of the, um, like causing one of these tree merges. And then that tree may need to read data to the right that it didn't actually have that it was already handed to it to commute it. So it would just need access to the same data that the, that the whoever launched the process had. So it may need to do like one block read right away, but that's literally all that we need to do. So we, you, you, you can actually do all of these like CRDT commuting things um, in parallel without a ton of IO, which is nice. Um, yeah, any, any more questions or comments? Well, on the CRDT front, so mm -hmm. for almost all operations where like you're adding or querying, mm -hmm. the like beauty of the append only like mergeability of sets, like you're, mm -hmm. as you commuting, no problem. And then there's, a, and then only in the situation where like you're mutating state and removing something, and in fact want to actually clean up the the, the blocks that you have, mm -hmm. do you have to worry about like knowing if some if some past like uh, mutation deleted something and then another one added it back or vice versa. So no, like CRDT no, so, so, behavior here there would be okay, right? Is that right? Does that make sense? No, no, it's actually, it's, it's a little bit simpler than that, right? So um, th this is how it would work. One is that you, you need to look at the SQL AST once to see um, if it's a pure insert without a read associated with it. And if it's a pure insert, then um, you can actually just, you know that that'll commute with all the other inserts. But if you try to apply them in different orders, you're actually, you are, you are gonna get a different hash. So you need to like set those aside. Um, then like for the rest of the queries, you're gonna have some kind of uh, read on write semantics going on. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, and you cannot predict in SQL what that looks like, right? Like it's, it, things get crazy. Like, and if you look at the kind of backflips that Postgres has to do to figure out like um, which intermediate state changes that it needs access to and stuff, it gets really, really complicated. Um, but like SQL is just such a powerful language. You can do like the like multiple selects that do math and commute things together and then produce the right that you're doing, right? And so if you've got a thousand writes that are all happening at once, you like have no way by looking at the tree really to know like, oh, this one ended up like reading some data that this other guy wrote <laughs> um, right. or, or wrote over or changed. So the, so the easiest thing to do is literally just to like run the statement against each other's state and then see if the hashes match or not. <laughs> like that's the easy way to do it. There's, there's a, a, I was talking with McCullough about it and he was like, well, no, there's a bunch of stuff that we could do to actually like narrow that down. So there's, there's a way that you can get out of like a lot of the computational like overhead, but there, I think that there's always gonna end up being some really complex SQL cases that you'll, you'll need to like not do that and just always be running the statement to check again. But as you commit them, right, you're just kind of jamming the statements together actually. Like you, you're just sort of like adding one statement to another as you commute them and you're adding the, the read and write sets. And then at the very end of com commuting all of them, you would just wanna rerun the whole combined query set so that what you end up with is a proof that is, um, what like doesn't include all the orphan data that might've changed between right. all the commuting operations. Yeah. That's the easiest way to commute them actually. Like it's, it's probably, that's probably easier than trying to go through the tree and figure out what was orphaned from the set. Right, so you just co collect them all and then rerun the query and trim it that way. Yep, yep, yeah. That's, I mean, the, the thing about SQL queries is that like the data structures are designed to reduce the computational load. So this mindset that you get into, um, especially when you're working with blockchain, which is like, how do I decrease like processing? How do I decrease processing? How do I get like all of that down? Um, like SQL is all about sort of building data structures that are fast to query and easy to query. And so just kind of let SQL do that um, and, you know, get out of the way and, and really work with like, how do we define the subsets of data that are needed and reduce the amount of data needed for operations? Hmm. 
yeah. Um, I think I'm out of time now, so this is probably a good place to stop. Um, yeah, I was just about to say that. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. thanks everyone for attending and see you all again next week. Bye everyone.